episodes, I'm going to cut off the first three minutes of this wasted time. <laughs> so it seems like an intelligent stream. Okay, a cleanup crew is what you need to keep the algae at bay in your tank. And if you don't have enough cleanup crew in your tank, you're going to continue to have algae problems. And that is something that inherently happens all the time with every reef keeper. When people complain to me they have an algae problem, I automatically ask them, you know, do you have a cleanup crew? How old is it? You know, is it time to replenish it? You know, how many of each item do you have? And so, you know, usually they don't have very much stuff at all and they have a bunch of algae. And that's exactly what I would expect because you need a lot of little hungry mouths to be devouring the algae in your tank so your tank can stay clean and pretty. Now, my general rule of thumb is one critter per gallon. So if you have a 100 gallon tank, you need 100 cleanup crew critters in your tank. And I have an article on my website. I'm gonna put it in the description of this video because I got rid of the other one. And all you have to remember is milosreef.com slash C-U-C. If you can remember that, CUC stands for cleanup crew. Click that, it'll take you to the right article on my website. And there's a list with a bunch of pictures of the creatures I recommend you put in your tank, as well as at the bottom of that article will be about six companies you can purchase from if you're not gonna buy it locally from a fish store. The cleanup crew is important because you need stuff that's gonna work the glass, you're gonna need things that work the rock work, you're gonna need things that work the sand bed. And these are the three areas of our tank. So what I recommend is that you get astrea snails or troca snails. Uh, I'd like to, you know, that's going to work on the glass. Seraths are another good one. Tiny seraths are another good one for along the sand bed where it touches the glass, that bottom inch where it gets really thick with algae. That they focus on that. Uh, margarita snails, I'm not so much of a fan of uh, because they could possibly climb out of the tank, <laughs> especially those of you with a rimless tank. I like sand conchs. I like fighting conchs. Those are larger snails that will work their way through the sand bed. I love Nasseria snails. These are ones that you want to have in your, your uh, sand bed, and you want, them, you want to have enough of them. And uh, I also like serpent starfish, not brittle starfish, serpent starfish. They will work their way across the detritus on the sand bed and keep it clean. They'll look for snacks. They'll consume things. And... Uh, Emerald crabs are a good choice for Valonia. So, and a tuxedo urchin or a diadema urchin will be good to work across the rock work. And they will eat any algae they can find. So that's in a nutshell. That's keeping the conversation super short so you get to the point immediately. Each of these items has their benefits. Uh, there are some downsides to adding a cleanup crew to your tank. Uh, if cleanup crew items die in your tank, they're going to add to the ammonia level. They're going to add to the nutrient level because they're rotting in the tank. But their benefits completely outweigh their, their, uh, their downside. And I would totally recommend that you get yourself a good, beefy cleanup crew. So here, let's think about it this way. When you buy a bunch of snails, or um, whether they're from your fish store or you buy them online, if you'll notice, all their shells are super clean. And the reason they're so clean is they are in bins or vats filled with water, and it's just a bunch of serif snails. It's a bunch of astra snails. It's a bunch of troca snails. And those snails are cleaning each other because there's nothing to eat in that tank before you buy it. So basically, they're showing up starving. They're hungry. They're ready to work. And any snails you already have in your tank right now are lazy. You know they're lazy because you got algae growing everywhere. There's probably algae growing on their back. And that is something you don't like. And so you want to resolve it. You want to get rid of that. And so getting a bunch of hungry cleanup crew is the first step in the right direction to getting algae under control in your tank. Uh, Alexander just asked, how often should you replenish your cleanup crew? I would say when you notice that you're missing a lot of them or you're starting to see algae growing, it's a great time to get more. So I would be sure to replenish. I, Usually in the past, we replenish my cleanup crew every six to nine months. And part of the reason I did it at that frequency is that was pretty much when I was doing a group buy where I would organize and get a whole bunch of cleanup crew shipped from Florida to my door that went to 10, 15, 25 of my club members, and I would distribute them to everyone because it saved us money. So, you know, we'd buy this giant box. It would have 2,000 critters in it. $90 shipping divided by 25 people, you know, it was like $4 a person plus the actual items in the box. 
and that worked out really well, except I spent that day when they arrived counting out snails and putting them in Ziploc bags for this person and then counting out hermits for this person and counting out uh, and then finding uh, some people bought peppermint shrimp, uh, some people bought harlequin starfish, you know, there was all these fun things you could get, arrow crab, all fun critters you can add to your tank. But the problem is, is that I had to do all the work because the company in Florida that I was dealing with, it was too much effort. You know, we were buying 2,000 to 6,000 critters at a time. And for them to bag up 25 in a bag and 50 in a bag, you know, and doing lots of little bags, it became too much work. You know, they are used to selling to fish stores and sending a whole bunch. Well, yeah, it was great that we were buying 6,000 critters in one order, but they'd have to spend an entire day or day and a half just organizing our order. One order, you know, day and a half, that's a lot of time spent. So instead I said, well, look, you know, if you'll just put them in giant bags, I'll count them out and separate them. And that's what I did. It was a lot of work. But, uh, okay, so let's talk about why the different snails, because I didn't get into that yet. I like astrias a lot, and I want, I, you know, you'll see the pictures on the CUC article, milosreef.com slash CUC, and that's in the description below when this video is released. Uh, the astria snail has a cone shape, and what it does is it works its way up the glass, it will work its way back down the glass. It'll go up the overflow box. It'll go on the ex it'll go onto your lock line tubing, and it'll be cleaning off anything it can find algae on, and <clears throat> it'll work its way through the rock work as well. So the more you know, I like to have a lot of those. You know, in my tank, I have easily added a hundred to two hundred astrias at a time to my uh, big tanks in the past, whether it's a two eighty or the four hundred now, and astrias I put them everywhere, but. When you're adding an astria to your tank, the smartest way to add a, a snail to your tank would be to put it on the glass and hold it until it comes out of its shell and grabs on. Problem is, it takes about a minute for a snail to come out of its shell when it's nervous. You know, it feels like, what the heck's going on? Who's touching me? And so it stays inside the shell and you have to wait and it finally comes out. I used to joke that I would pet their shell, you know, just stroke it and it would make the snail come out. But who can do that with 100 or 200 snails? That means 100 to 200 minutes it's too much time. I can't do it. So my solution, I get these jars that um, I buy jelly in, and I, after they're empty, I clean them out really well, and I just save them for whenever I need them one day. And I can put the, gel, the jar full of snails inside my reef at the bottom, and that's it. I just ignore it. I put two or three jars in my reef, and I let them sit there all day long, and at night, when I go look with a flashlight, all the snails come bubbling out of the, the jar and they, what they do is they climb up the sides of the jar and they climb down the sides of the jar and they go across the sand bed and up the rock work and up the wall, the glass wall. It's perfect. It's really a great way to introduce snails because they can pick, <clears throat> they can decide when to come out of their shell and the first thing they find when they stick their foot out is a solid surface to grab onto. Uh, you could park each snail foot side down on the sand bed and wait till they come out. Uh, but I like the jar system because I can put a jar here and a jar there and a jar way over there and kind of get them dispersed in my reef. And like I said, they come out like popcorn. They just bubble out and they go everywhere and it's awesome. And usually those snails, because they're brand new, they're white. And so they stand out against my, my uh, coralline and algae, uh, should we call it infested? You know, it never looks that way. But, you know, there's hints of algae on the rock work. And so you see this bright white snail on there and you can see them and... When you first introduce a huge cleanup crew to your tank, at night when you look, they're everywhere. It's awesome. I mean, I love it. I mean, it makes me feel good that I have this huge crew working on my reef. And actually, right now, I am way behind in adding a cleanup crew to my tank. I need to do it. I need to place an order for a big crew, and I'm going to. Uh, it's it's going to happen very, very, very soon. Um, if you and Now, the thing with an astria snail that I didn't mention yet in this stream is that they fall over and they land on their back and they don't go right back up. And you would think, well, the snail came from the ocean. How does it not know how to get back on its foot by itself? Why is it so stupid? Well, in the ocean, the water is doing this all the time. And so the snail sitting on its back will rock back and forth until it can flip over and then get back on its merry little way. In our reef tank, that motion just isn't there. It's not there. So instead, what we do is we have to flip them over and put them right side up or stick them close to the glass where they can grab on the glass again. And so that it will be your full-time job. Whenever you see an astria upside down, you have to ride it or it will just die in that spot or something will eat it. You could have uh, hermit crabs eating it, 
a fish might eat it, like a wrasse. Uh, they like meaty foods, they'll just go for it. So you have to keep them uh, safe by turning them right side up. If you don't want to deal with astrias and you say, I'd rather have a snail that I don't have to babysit, <laughs> which I understand, then get a trochus. Trochus snails are basically the same shape. They have a slightly different look uh, and they are smart. They know how to get back onto their foot without any assistance by, from us. So that would be ideal for uh, a choice if you didn't want astrias, get trochus snails. Another snail that I like is the margarita snail, but it could climb out of your tank. As I mentioned before, uh, if your tank is rimless and nerites do the same darn thing, they, those are intertidal snails, which means they like to come up the rock work and actually get out into the air and then go back down underwater. And so if you get a bunch of nerites and you might find some on the floor, you might hear a crunch sound, you know, because you just stepped on one. Or your pets might eat it. So, you know, if you have dogs and cats and there's this thing on the floor, they might chew it up. And who knows what that would do to your animal? So I try to avoid snails that are going to escape my tank. Serith snails, there's large ones and there's tiny ones. And the large ones are great. They clean the glass. The tiny ones are great because they clean that area right where the sand touches the glass, that little one-inch layer. Uh, that area where you're always trying to take a picture and there's crap on the glass, little tiny serifs eat that. So that's good. For bubble algae, you can add an emerald crab. If you have a, a lot of uh, Valonia, you might need a lot of emerald crabs. Emerald crabs, though, have, uh, they don't have the best, uh, people tend to gripe about them, is what I'm trying to say. And, you know, they'll say, oh, they, they ripped up my zoanthids, or they, uh, they never touched a Valonia. I was like, well, you know, it's not a guarantee, but they do eat them. Uh, they definitely eat Valonia. It's just a matter of time. It depends how hungry they are. It can even matter which ones you get. Like, which, like for example, the fish around me, he was very proud of the emerald crabs he got, and he says, I have the right ones. You buy mine, they're going to eat your valonia. And so I was like, good enough for me, and I bought some from him. So you can do that. The, uh, you know, they'll help. Uh, I've also discovered that emerald crabs will eat calerpa. So if you have a problem with calerpa in your tank, they can eat it. I was shocked. I had this little tank by my front door of my house years ago. And uh, when you first walked in, there was this really pretty tank. But man, a piece of calerpa got in there, and I could not stop it from growing. I kept pulling out what I could reach, and I'd get frustrated. And, you know, I'd get it down to a nub and, you know, then give it a little time, ignore the tank for a week or two, and it just sprouted out again. And one day I discovered an emerald crab down there just chowing down on it. I was so excited. So I reached in, I ripped away as much as I possibly could and let him get the last of it. And he finished it off. He got the root system. He killed it. I was super happy about that. So emerald crab was a great benefit for me in that case. I was glad, you know, I, he was there for Valonia, but he took out the Calerpa, which was great. Um, if you have Bryopsis, you're going to need a different kind of critter to eat that. And uh, it's not really a cleanup crew item, but it's a Bergia and nudibranch. And those things are super lightweight and they float into the water, but you can put them in there on that algae and they'll start to snack on it. And uh, it's, it's, an, it's a constant battle. You're gonna have to rip out what you can. You're gonna have to blow off that coral, like literally take a turkey baster and squirt it or put a power head pointing right at it to blast all the detritus out of the, the plant itself because it's trying to make its own little tiny deep sand bed. So if you rip out all that crap, and just leave just blades of grass sticking off the rock, so to speak, you know, this bryopsis, the nudibranchs will eat what's left uh, if you can get rid of that trap detritus because it uses that as nutrients to grow more. Uh, bryopsis is a really tricky one. It's not your typical algae. It's a vicious algae. We don't want that in our tanks, and that is the one that consumes it. If you have pink cotton candy algae, you need the giant Mexican turbo snails. Those are big, uh, size of a ping pong ball probably or larger. And they're like bulldozers. So you put it in your tank, you know, you put a few, you know, two or three of those in your tank, depending on what size tank you have. And it will go through and consume the pink cotton candy algae, but the problem is that it'll knock things over. You'll just have corals just get knocked over. So there's the downside of that. Uh, other normal cleanup crew items is the Nasseria snail. There are little tiny ones, and then there are the Tongan Nasseria snails, so they're much larger, the size of an olive. And those things are awesome because they stir the sand bed. They just move through the sand all the time. They actually go down in it and they stick their trunk up. So you've got the sand bed here and there's this little trunk sticking up and that's all you see. But when you put food in the water, they all emerge like submarines and become visible. And then they'll start scurrying about and they're very active. They move very quickly across the sand. 
Neisseria snails can look like whelks, so you want to make sure you're not buying whelks because whelks eat meat. And that means if you put in whelks with snails, the whelks will eat the snails and you'll have no snails and you'll have a bunch of fat, healthy whelks. You don't want whelks, you want Neisseria snails. On my article, on my website, there's an article uh, comparing a whelk to a Neisseria, so you can see them side by side. They look very similar, do not get the wrong kind. You want Neisseria's Vibex, basically, and those are the good ones, uh, or the Super Tongans, because you can't mix that up with a whelk. Another one that I want to recommend to you is a conch, and a conch is like a fighting conch or a sand conch. They're about this big, you know, they can get them smaller. You can get them big, but you want a small sand conch for every two feet of sand bed. So if you have a six foot by two foot tank, you can put three sand conchs in that reef. If you have a two foot by two foot tank, you put one conch in there. The reason you don't put more than, the, than one conch per two square feet is because it'll starve to death. And then you just have a dead conch. You, know, you, have, an, you have an empty shell. So get yourself the right amount of conchs. They also stir the sand bed. They can climb up on the rock work. They're not as prone to do that. They might reach up to get a snack, but they go back down to the substrate. They like it down there. Uh, they may climb up the glass. Uh, that's kind of a cool effect. Um, cowries are a fun cleanup crew. And uh, they can be small, like the money cowrie or the... What is it? For some reason in my head, I'm... Uh, whatever, I'm not even going to say it because I'm mixed up. But uh, then I have the large one, the tiger cowrie. And that thing is huge. I've had it in my tank for years. I love it. And uh, darn thing knocks things over, but I just don't care. I love seeing it. It's been out in the front of my tank for the last couple of days, and I've been enjoying looking at it. Uh, it's up on the glass all the time. It sometimes will be discovered late at night. It has made its way all the way to the feeding clip where I had put some nori at one point, and it will eat all it can. And the funny thing is because this is such a large uh, slug with a huge shell. I mean, it's the size of a lemon that the weight of it can pull the feeding clip right off the glass, and it, you hear this kunk. And it's because the shell, I mean, the slug fell to the bottom of the sand bed with still holding on to the feeding clip. And of course, the magnet drops on the outside of the tank. It happens occasionally. Uh, but I just correct the situation, you know, or I wait till the uh, cowrie lets go of the feeding clip and I'll connect them back on the glass. Um, things you would not add as a cleanup crew would be like bristle worms. We don't add it on purpose, but they're okay to have. But if you have too many, you can add an arrow crab because arrow crabs eat bristle worms. And what they do is they eat what's visible. They're not going to devour them and destroy them and get rid of them completely. But then again, bristle worms are not a bad part of your cleanup crew. They are part of the detrivores. They eat detritus. So having some uh, bristle worms in your tank are fine. Having thousands, not fine. We always want to have everything in relation. Everything should be balanced in our system. So too much of anything tends to be a nuisance and an arrow crab will help keep those under control to where you don't have too many. Um, another member of the cleanup crew would be an urchin, and I love the tuxedo urchin. I, I think it's a great urchin because it doesn't cause any harm. Uh, it, it will eat algae. It will work its way across overflow boxes and across the glass, and it'll work its way across the sand and over the rock work. It goes everywhere. So tuxedo urchins are really nice. They will pick things up and stick them to their body as they're hiking around. And that was one of my pictures I was going to show you. But you'll see it on the CUC article on my website. And uh, it could carry something funny on its back. Like uh, I've seen it carry an a, a anemone on its back because it was a very small one. I've seen it carry a feather duster on its back. I've seen it carry, you know, bits of coral or bits of rock on its back too. Sometimes occasionally it'll pull a few zoanthids with itself as it moves its way around the tank. Another urchin that you may prefer instead of a tuxedo urchin, which I just I like them because they're so pretty. They have the blue uh, sections between their needles. Um, but the diadema urchin is another good one. And the diadema urchin definitely eats hair algae. The downside of a diadema urchin is it could stab you, and they always stab you in the knuckle. <laughs> you're cleaning your tank and stab. You're like, oh, you know, it's like, got me. So you have to be careful when you have an urchin in your tank with long quills because that could, you know, kind of mess up your day and hurt your hand for a little while. It's, uh, I've had them in the past. When they get, when they grow really, really large, then I give them back to the fish store to give to someone with a bigger tank. But uh, diadema urchin is a good one. And, um, 
trying to think if there's anything else. Another part of your cleanup crew that you might want is a serpent starfish. And I love serpent starfish. There's banded, there's harlequin, there's just the regular single color. Uh, there's brown ones that are, you know, kind of tan colored. There are some that are bright red. Uh, there are some that are black. Uh, there's lots of different colors. And I'm not going to tell you that you have to limit yourself on those. You could have one, two, or three of them. Uh, the serpent starfish, they just look for snacks. So they'll capture whatever food you drop in the tank. You know, if you drop in pellet food, they'll grab a pellet. You'll see their arm snake out, and they grab the pellet and bring it all the way to their mouth, and they consume it. Uh, you can directly feed them a piece of krill from time to time. They should be able to find food on their own. And, you know, I've got probably six serpent starfish in my two tanks. And uh, I, I don't feed them directly at all. I just throw food in the tank. And I've had them for years. Two of my serpent stars I got in 2003. So I've had them for 15 years. And then I've got a red serpent star that I've had for about five years. And twice the darn thing climbed up the, the overflow wall where my Vortec pumps are and got its arm inside the Vortec, and the Vortec spun around and ripped the arm off, knocked the Vortec off the glass of the tank, and the poor starfish, you know, it scurried away, you know, missing an arm. And I felt so bad for the starfish, of course, and I had to take apart the pump and take out the tentacle, you know, toss it, because I'm not going to grow a new one from a tentacle, and put the Vortec back together. And the starfish completely healed. And I was like, oh, you look great. All five arms look perfect. And then... It was basically a year later, I heard the same kunk. I was like, are you kidding me? And again, that starfish had lopped off his arm. I was like, dang it. Well, I've had him five years. It's only happened twice. He looks totally intact. I'd like to say he's learned his lesson. I don't know if it's even a he. Um, and I'll tell you really quickly that starfish don't have a front and a back. They don't have like a side with eyes. and a, you know, They just don't. They, they can go any direction at any time. So hopefully it has a brain in the center that knows to stay away from my Vortec pumps forever. It's the only starfish that's ever had a problem with the Vortec pump, too, out of all of my starfish I've had. I have a banded starfish in there I've had probably since 2008, 2009. So that's going on 10 years. I mean, they're long-living animals, and so they're great to have in your tank because they're constantly there to work on stuff. Uh, I just saw a question scroll by asking, would you put a starfish in your sump? Or could you put the part of that star in your sump and wait for it to grow? Not from an arm. It has to have part of the oral disc in the center because that's the mouth. And it's also the butt. <laughs> so just an arm won't grow anything. It just can't. So, um, All right. So let's say you're like, well, gee, Mark, I have a 100-gallon tank. You tell me I need 100 critters. The fish drawer charges $350 a critter, you know, $350 for a snail. I'm looking at $350. That's, I'm not spending that kind of money. There's no way. Well, that's basically why I recommend you buy them online. And that way you can get a big package at a bulk price and they're delivered to your door. That would be the benefit to online shopping. Uh, you can talk with your fish store and say, look, I want to get 100 items. Can we get a better deal? And see if he'll go for it. Uh, also, you could say, could we add, I mean, this is just long shot ideas here okay you because we've done similar things in the past you could say to the store look i want to buy a huge cleanup crew i know you only stock so much at a time could you add my order to your next order and give me a better price you know and i'll pick it all up at once the day it arrives you don't you don't have to do anything you know I'll just like i'll just take it immediately bagged up as is you know no acclimation and uh, you might find your way to save some money that way and that could be a, a potential solution uh, to saving money. But I would highly recommend having enough cleanup crew. If you put in just a light cleanup crew, you'll continue to have an algae problem. You'll be frustrated. You'll be unhappy. So I would definitely say do that. Reefer Road, this is a solid subject. It's not a ramble. It's I'm talking about cleanup crews. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, someone is talking about harlequin shrimp. I'm talking about harlequin starfish. I want to make sure that we're clear on that. All right. Let's see.
actually, I think that's pretty much all I have to say on this topic. Um, if you haven't added any clean up crew to your tank in a while, you need to replenish it. If uh, you're starting to see algae growth everywhere, it's time to add new hungry snails, new hungry hermits. Did I talk about hermits yet? I feel like I didn't talk about them in this stream. When it comes to hermit crabs, they have blue legs, they have red legs, they have scarlets, there's Halloween hermits, you know, there's, you know, with different color markings. If you get blue legs, try to get the tiniest ones you can, because tiny ones eat algae and don't attack snails. Larger uh, blue legs tend to be aggressive and go for the snails and eat the snails. And you, you want snails and you want hermits, so you want both. So I would get tiny blue legs if you can. You know, you look at when you're ordering, make sure that you can choose what size you're getting. Hopefully they mark it in a way that's clear. Uh, red legs are less aggressive. So if you're worried about blue legs at all, just get red legs. And scarlets cost much more. I mean, they might be $3 each, but they're beautiful. And so I always throw in a few of them just for eye candy because I enjoy watching them work their way through the tank. They're bright red. They're really, really pretty. Um, and then a Halloween uh, crab would just be for fun. <laughs> it, I wouldn't add Halloween crabs to clean my tank. Uh, number one, they're kind of expensive, and uh, they're just for fun. So do that. The, so we talked about hermits, snails, urchins, um, conchs, and starfish. Yeah, that's all the, the creatures that I recommend. So when again i might be repeating myself because i'm a little confused where i left off in the last stream trying to come to this stream whenever you're buying new cleanup crew they're all very hungry and ready to go versus the ones that you might say well i have 15 snails in my tank and they're not doing anything it's like because they're lazy they're not starving they they haven't been sitting in a bin waiting to be purchased with no food source available they're in your, your reef and there's food everywhere and there, there's too much food for them. They can't even consume it all. So you have to get new ones. And I like that the brand new ones are going to uh, clean each other before you even get them. Because you put them in your tank and they're all nice and clean. So I feel like I talked about that. Ah, sea cucumbers. Thank you. Uh, you definitely want a cucumber. I recommend the tiger tail cucumber. Um, it's one that moves through the sand bed. It actually eats the sand and poops out clean sand at the other end. If you put in... Uh, like the yellow cucumbers that never ever move, they're just for looks. They glue onto the glass and they park there for the rest of their lives. Or they glue onto a rock and they just sit there and they filter feed, but they do nothing to clean your tank. They're just kind of snacking off the water column. So that one's no good. I don't recommend a sea apple as a item for a cleanup crew. Again, it's something pretty to look at. I'll tell you this, they have a huge reputation of being a hand grenade in your reef. Basically, the premise is if one of those things dies, it just takes out your whole tank. My dad had one in his tank when I was a kid. And uh, I don't know what happened. I don't even know how my dad stopped having a tank. I don't know where, it, what he did with it. I'll have to ask him because I'm curious now. But maybe it was, they moved houses and he just took it all to the fish drawer. I have no idea. But occasionally I see sea apples. They're beautiful. I love watching them. You know, they just, they're so delicate looking. They kind of have a, you know, they're a colorful thing like a pomegranate pomegranate and yet their fronds look more like a dendronephthia which is a soft coral that we love from fiji and they're so pretty to look at but i've never taken the risk of putting one in my tank maybe i should do it because i'm i've been in the hobby a long time maybe i should get Dwayne to do it put it in his tank <laughs> i'll ask Dwayne what he thinks of sea apples and then we'll see uh, but anyway they're really pretty but they're not a cleanup crew item Uh, Awkward Fish says, are any fish good as a cleanup crew? The bristletooth tang is a great cleanup crew fish. Uh, it actually worked. I'm, I've got one over there in my tank right now, the coal. Uh, the yellow eye coal is one. And they will actually kiss the glass, eating algae off the glass, and they will actually work the sand too. Mine's actually rummaging through the sand bed. Uh, Rasses, like the yellow coarse wrasse, will also pick through your sand bed, but they're looking for food. You know, they're looking for worms and they're looking for pods. So they're actually taking away from your healthy sand bed. You want to have critters living in that top half inch of sand. And if your sand bed is dead, then you're going to have algae problems. Matter of fact, dead algae, uh, I mean dead sand beds, do not get a sand sifting starfish for a reef tank. If you want a fish only tank, that's fine. 
but sand sifting starfish eat everything out of the sand bed until the sand bed is lifeless, and then you end up with algae everywhere. You'll get cyano on the surface of the sand. Your sand will look like crap because there's nothing alive in it, keeping it tumbling, keeping it oxygenated. They kill everything. And I've been in fish stores where a customer is buying a bunch of stuff, and I'm looking at all their stuff in the cart. And I'm like, why did you buy a sand sifting starfish? You have a reef tank. And they're like, yeah, I have a reef tank. And I look at the employee like, are you really selling them this? And the guy says, you didn't tell me this is going in a reef. No, you can't have that. <laughs> I was like, nice save. Bottom line is, no sand sifting starfish in a reef tank. It's just not advised. It's not a, it, it eats too much of the good stuff to be considered a good creature. Yeah, it moves your sand around a lot, but it eats everything good in it. So I do not recommend it to anyone. Um, one person suggested the algae blenny as a critter, critter to help eating algae. That's hit or miss. Um, I've never put an algae blend in my tank to get rid of algae. I put it in the tank because it was fun to look at. Sand sifting goby will make your sand bed move around, but you're better off with nasarius. You're better off with cucumbers. You're better off with starfish, uh, like the serpent starfish. Anything in the serpent starfish family is fine. Uh, those are the ones that I recommend to keep your sand looking good. And of course, a good, uh, good flow in the tank. If you only have one or two power heads and your water is essentially stagnant near the sand bed, your sand bed's always gonna look dirty. It's gonna look messy. So you wanna do that. Also, mentioning sand sifting gobies, they also will cover your uh, corals that are sitting on the sand bed. So if you have something pretty down there, like a uh, fungia or scolemia or chalice, they'll just bury it and you know, you'll discover the next day dead. So I don't like those type of fish that bury corals that are down on the sand bed. If you have frag plugs sitting in the sand and they've got zoanthids on them, they'll be covered. You know, <laughs> they've just been frosted with sand and that's it. So it's a bad choice. I wouldn't put them in a, uh, in a tank with corals on the sand. If you have all your corals on the rock work, sure, put that fish in there. There's all kinds of cool gobies that can go and move sand around. So that's it. Guys, it's three o'clock. I'm gonna stop this live stream now. Thank you for tuning in. I apologize that the software didn't cooperate. I makes me mad, but whatever. We survived another Saturday. If you haven't, okay, I got some news really quick. Um, if you didn't see the video I uploaded last night, well, this morning at six in the morning, Dwayne's Reef is on the channel. It's beautiful. It's a 30 minute video. He's interviewed the entire time and there's angles from his tank from every angle. So check it out. Uh, hopefully you like it. You know, you like that. You like the stream. Thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. Click the bell. By the way, I found out about the bell. I mentioned it a couple weeks ago. Turns out the bell is specific for mobile phones. So if you click the bell when you subscribe to a channel, then the app in your phone for YouTube will notify you if the notifications are turned on in the app. And it'll tell you, hey, uh, such and such channel has a, a live stream or such and such channel has uploaded a new video. But if you turn off that notification because it's bugging you, it doesn't matter how many bells you click, you'll get no notifications at all. And we're talking about push notifications, the ones that come to the lock screen of your phone where it's like, ding, there's something new, and you, know, you get the little message at the top of your screen. That's what the bell is for. It's not so you'll find out they upload a new video every single time. It is a way to notify you. So it's for smartphones only, it's not for desktop. The subscription is more like a bookmark. Um, bottom line is, if you want to see what's new on the channel, you have to come back to the channel and you have to look. So, you know, hopefully you'll get an email notification. Typically subscriptions, you may get an email once a week saying such and such uploaded a video. Um, the bell is the better way if you're staying connected. And uh, other than that, you just have to tune in. You just have to say, what did Mark put up lately? I share things on Facebook, facebook.com slash Milo's Reef. So I'm constantly sharing there. So that's a good way to find me. I'm on Instagram and that's gonna be instagram.com slash Milo's Reef. See, all these slides I normally use my software didn't work. Um, also, there's two events coming out this month. Houston, that's why I'm wearing the Marsh shirt today. Uh, Houston is doing Reef Currents, which is their one day trade show. And I'm going to be releasing a video before that show happens of a previous Reef Current so you can see what it's about. And that will be on April 21st. And I'm just gonna say it's all day long because I don't remember the hours. I, I'm pretty sure it is. So it's a Saturday, April 21st, so it's in a few weeks, a couple weeks, and uh, you go to reefcurrents.org, and that will be in this video's description. And then San Antonio, the following weekend on Sunday, is doing their frag swap. I'm going to be at both of these events. I'm going there just to be a hobbyist. I'm not there to sell or to speak or anything like that. I just said, hey, I'm going to come down there and enjoy your show. 
So I'll be there if you want to meet up. I'll be there. And uh, I will put links to both of those in the description, as well as the cleanup crew. I uh, just got a message that said Texas Coral Fest is on April 22nd. That is an event that is hosted by one of our club members who's doing his own show. And uh, I will find a link for that, and I will put it on uh, the description since it was brought up. Uh, Texas Coral Fest is a bunch of vendors only. And uh, usually the room is really dark and the music's really loud. Because <laughs> the guy that runs it is or was a DJ in the past. So, buy your corals. That's how it is over there. It's kind of funny. All right, guys, I'm going to let it go. I've got a customer that's going to come over, and uh, i got to get off this thing right now. But I hope you have a great weekend. Make sure you test your water. Do your water changes. Post your results on Instagram. Hashtag water testing. Hashtag post your results. If you don't have Reef Trace, buy it. It's for Android and for iPhone. And that's it. i got to go. Bye. Love you all.